Hey, welcome back to another episode of Armchair Architects here in the Azure Enablement Show, where we're talking about AI. So in the previous episode, we had this big explosive conversation about all sorts of things. Um, and I wanted to take it down to some of those individual parts that we were talking about. Wooly presented a framework, and I wanna sort of walk each one of those pieces of the framework so we actually address them, um, even if it's a little bit. Well, welcome back, architects. Um, I want to take each one of the pieces of the larger conversation that we were talking about that got us in here. Um, the first thing I was hoping we'd talk about is, Willie, you suggested that organizations, when they get into this, need to form a charter. They need to create a charter. And I have to admit, I agree with it. And I'm also a little curious, why do you need an AI charter and not like every other kind? Like, like what's so special about AI that we need to have a charter versus any other charter that would be that we've already created for the for the uh, the running of the business? I think there are two really dimensions that I think about. The first one is the society dimension. While people think about AI, they think Skynet, they think Terminator, they think these evil things that effectively will take over the world and. Um, enslave humanity kind of thing. So from my perspective, since this is the picture that humanity has of AI as a larger society, I think it's our obligation to be proactive and transparent to say, no, 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 no. Actually, we are using AI for good purposes. And what good means is X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the transparency side of the house where effectively as a company, you want to be upfront and visible, transparent of what's going on so that you, you're clearly saying we're not going to do Skynet, guys. Um, so I think that's step one. The other side is you need to have a way for your employees to figure out, hey, we could build Skynet. That could be fun. But that they effectively say, I don't do this because I know what our charter is for AI. And then there is a third element, which is if you are in a business like Microsoft or a technology provider, you will get asked to do things with AI, with your AI technology that might not be great. Let me give you a very concrete example. Um, a couple of years ago, before the large language model world, uh, we were asked by a country to go and help um, manage the population uh, through face recognition technology. and. This was a country that has an authoritarian model of uh, leadership. And we effectively, uh, the sales team was very excited, big opportunity, uh, lots of money. The delivery team was a little bit like, hmm, what is this going to be used for? And I'm not going to speculate what the country wanted to use it for, but effectively the delivery team was very nervous. And so they escalated inside Microsoft. And we ultimately declined the opportunity because it didn't fit our values that AI is here to help humanity, to support, supplement uh, human capabilities, which is our charter at the end of the day. Um, and therefore, we declined the opportunity. I don't know what happened with that country, what they did, but ultimately, that was a very clear decision based upon charter, based upon uh, what we do and don't do with AI. And so we said, thank you very much. And so this is really what I mean when I say you have a charter because everybody is worried about the Skynet Terminator world. And then you have concrete asks where you might even, you might have to have a decision which is uncomfortable. You're, you're turning away in business, which is never a fun thing to do. And if you never write down your principles, then you don't really know what they are, especially in a morally ambiguous situation. I remember that example, Uli, and it was involved in a lot of that conversation. And largely that led to Microsoft codifying a lot of the responsible AI principles that we have now. That was a seminal moment for us. Um, and I, what, what's also very interesting to me, David, is that we're back again. It's almost like it's 2015 and 2016 talking about these same things, these same considerations. Uh, but they're even more salient now than they were back then when we were just doing statistical algorithmic probabilistic modeling, right? Yeah, the, and just for, for, for people that are interested, um, there is a really fantastic book called Weapons of Math Destruction, yeah. uh, which it doesn't talk about LLMs yet, which are even more powerful than what uh, statistics models can do, but it shows what statistics models can do in terms of uh, how wrong they can go 
um, with the best intentions. And again, if you have a charter and very clear principles, as Eric points out, um, I think you're in better shape. So one of the things I don't want to leave people with the understanding, and I don't think you're suggesting this, is that the charter isn't necessarily how do we avoid destruction of the human race in that necessary like that like that that's obviously like the, the end condition right <laughs> like the, the worst possible condition but um ai can be used for smaller harms ai can be you ai can uh can have uh can have less dire consequences but still really negative impacting things to groups of people, to specific groups of people, to that sort of stuff. Can we talk just for a second about like when you're writing a charter, it's not like we won't be Skynet. It has to, it has to also include the less, you know, the the, the like the daily harm that this could be causing. So how do you well, how, every trip well, to Eric charter. works right now at a financial services company, right? And let's assume you're applying for a credit card. Most likely, an algorithm will evaluate you before it even gets to a human being. How is that algorithm being built? Um, how is that algorithm being trained? And what is that algorithm looking at? And if the algorithm then says, no, you're not going to get a credit card, that's obviously a very bad decision for you because you were looking forward to that uh, credit line and so forth. That's a quote unquote small decision with very large impact. Um, and that's where I think uh, this whole responsible AI, which we will talk about later, came from as mm. a consequence because of uh, these kind of examples. And again, the weapons of math destruction go into absolute group, uh, great details about these quote unquote small things like, oh, why don't we use algorithms to rate our teachers? Right. Um, and Or how do we go and use algorithms to figure out who should stay in jail and who should get par pardoned? Um, lots and lots of decisions that are being made using algorithms and data. And if the data is skewed a certain way, the algorithm will work in a certain way. And that's one of the reasons why it's very clear what you need to do is, hey, let's be very clear what we do, how we do it, and go from there. Yeah, agreed. Right, David, one of the things I think our listeners or our viewers might be crying out for is like, okay, I'm sold. We need one of these. We probably have one, actually but I might need to dust it off because LLMs are just all over the place now. What are the structures? What does it look like? How do I adjust it? Do I need to make any adjustments? Maybe I do or I don't. And so my adventures in this area recently have been around taking what we already have and then just looking at it through the lens of what LLMs give us today and what's hard about uh, implementing LLMs, especially in the hosted foundational model space today. So certainly you want to make sure that you've got a purpose and scope. Uh, and specific to LLMs clearly define the intended purpose. What are they going to be used for? What do we absolutely not trust this technology yet to be used for? And set those boundaries and revisit them. Um, there's also like data and ethics, uh, emphasizing the importance of high quality, bias-free, tokenized data with no PII um, and making sure that they match regulatory compliance, even if, if you're creating your own or you, you're creating RAG um, libraries, right? For, for posted foundational models. RAG, sorry, what? Uh, retrieval augmented generation. Basically, think about it as like a librarian of a store of knowledge that an LLM can actually access and look up information as it generates responses. Okay. So if you were if you're providing that library of expertise to a hosted foundational model, you need to have the same vigilance in terms of high quality bias free data that you're providing to that model and before you productionize it. Then the difficult topics like we discussed last time around transparency and explainability, and I like the way that Uli put it um, in our conversations, you can control what you feed it, you can control and observe what comes out of it. What happens in the middle is anybody's guess, but you have to get more purpose and predictive so you're not surprised. And managing what goes in and what comes out and analyzing it and doing prompt engineering and, and, and looking at how people are interacting with it judiciously is all going to be important. And then there's elements of like that bleeds into security and control, which is robust cybersecurity measures to protect against and gets unauthorized access to the LLMs, defining clear processes for detecting adversarial prompts um, if you're exposing prompts to regular, you know, regular users, uh, and then outlining accountability mechanisms for LLM outputs and actions. If it makes something up, if it hallucinates and you're not able to detect it, um, what happens if it makes crazy promises? Um, on your behalf as an organization, what do you do? How do you deal with that? 
Uh, and then we have human in a loop integration. Like Willie said, certain things are going to be automated and no human in a loop once we have that degree of confidence. What does that look like for LLM usage? How soon can we actually just extract humans and trust that the prompts and the outputs are actually going to be a accurate and low risk for the organization? Okay, so I think we're going to hit some of those later. I just want to ask one last question because we're coming coming to the end of this. I can assume that charters are awesome, but charters without any description of how employees are supposed to behave in relationship to them are much less awesome. Like it's cool to have like this mission statement that says, uh, I don't want to say do no harm because, well, you know, um, but, uh, you know, but it's a lot. It also seems to be to be important to say, and if you actively observe something that you are concerned about, if 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 you can spot something that goes against this, here is a clear, concise mechanism that you should follow or process that you should follow in regards to the charter, because otherwise it's just like a, you know, like be nice to other people document and, you know, yeah. just don't hit them over the head with the wrong technology thing, you know, uh, don't be don't be evil. Don't be sky there. Yeah. Also make it a living document. Yes, you know, things change all the time, and don't just put it up as a trophy on your website. Um, it's something that has to live and has to be lived every day, and had, you have to look at it um, and keep revising it because things change. So I think this is, for me, the foundation for any AR usage in any company. These two mm -hmm. elements, charter and escalation path, and maybe the third element being it's a living document that has been lived and is being uh, looked at and reviewed all the time. Okay, I dig it. Let's stop here. And in a future episode, let's hit some other stuff that we pulled out of the original episode um, because there's a lot more to talk about. So I want to thank the two of you and I want to thank everybody who's watching for joining us here on the Azure Enablement Show in Armchair Architect Land. Mm -hmm.